that's I'm pretty cool. You'll get it. to see you'll get to see a ton of Cowboys and Bills fans out there, dude. Like that's gonna be <laughs> awesome. I can't wait for you to run into a ton of Cowboys fans. It's gonna there. be a bunch of Eagles guys. I already know. I, I can't sure? wait to see I my know, family. I, <laughs> I can't wait to see my family. Yeah. What is going on, you guys? This is your boy, Joe Castro, a.k.a. Philly Fresco, and it is another episode of Philly Philly, the podcast. So today we have a very good, a very special guest, man, a very good, good guy. All right. I, I'm going to say that before we get into what he covers and what he does. Uh, but we're going to talk some Dallas Cowboys with the man himself, Kyle Yeomans. Kyle, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Joe. Excited for this matchup on Saturday. I know Dallas didn't necessarily hold up their end of the bargain to make it as interesting as it could have been uh, going into the matchup. I'm sure Philadelphia is pretty happy with that. But uh, either way, anytime these two teams come together, it should be a fun one. And I appreciate you having me on, Joe. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, Eagles fans aren't complaining. You guys, you, <laughs> it's all right. We're not too bad at you. Uh, but first, I want to talk about expectations. Last time we spoke, there was confidence in this Dallas team and, and rightfully so. Right now we're 15, 16 weeks into the, the season. We've seen the ups. We've seen the downs. Where is the confidence level uh, for this Cowboys team right now? You know, it's interesting. If you would have asked that question three weeks ago, I would have said sky high. I mean, they were coming off of a win against uh against minnesota where they won 40 to 3 on the road against the team that's fighting to be one of the top seeds in the nfc they uh they put up 33 points in the final quarter against indianapolis but then these last two weeks have really changed the the narrative around this cowboys team yeah they're 10 and 4. yes we've already clinched a, a spot in the playoffs but i don't think the uh the expectation level is where you would anticipate it being and partially uh, that comes from the, the past success in the playoffs and the lack thereof, the fact that they haven't won a ton of games in playoff time, really it, it keeps Cowboys fans reluctant to completely buy in. And even when they were uh, winning games easy and they were putting up points against Minnesota and Indianapolis like that, uh, Cowboys fans everywhere were still saying, I want to see playoff success. And that's what it's going to take. And especially after these last two games, it's it's really kind of taken a, a, a bit of a dive down. Even though they are one and one in those games, you didn't play well against the Texans. You, of course, didn't play well in the loss against Jacksonville. So if they're going to find a way to, to buy in and to build that confidence, they're going to need a strong, strong showing here over these next three weeks. Yeah, and one thing I feel... It has been constant with Eagles and Dallas Cowboys. There's always been kind of an identity. We always kind of, you know, whether it was the defense with the Eagles, offense with the Cowboys. But this year, I feel like it's a little bit weird. Like going into this season, I feel we all would have said this is a defensive team. This is a very, very good defensive team. Um, and that kind of got reaffirmed once, you know, Dak Prescott went down. You saw your defense going out mm -hmm. there winning you games. Then Dak comes back and the, the offense is electric. I'll give you like top three in most categories uh, over the past like five or six weeks. So it's yeah. been electric, but it feels like the defense maybe took a little bit of a step back or at least is losing a little bit of steam. My question to you is who is this Dallas Cowboys team? Who, who do we go into the game saying this is what we have to beat? This is the side of the football team that we have to you know go out there and dominate. Well, and Mike McCarthy said it earlier in the season, and I still think it, it reigns true. And it's the, the fact of the matter, this this Dallas defense is what sets the tone. They're the thermostat of this Cowboys team. If they're playing well, then that's where the, the, the offense can kind of fall in and, and do their thing. If they're not playing well, the offense is going to try and force things. And I think the perfect ex example of that was against Jacksonville. The defense did not play well against Jacksonville, and it's for a number of reasons. They've they've struggled to stop the run all year long. Injuries have nothing to do with that, but then you add on some injuries to guys like Leighton Van Der Esch uh, at that second level, it does play uh, a significant role. And then you've got Jonathan Hankins that was probably your best run stuffer in the middle of your defense, a guy that they added off of the free agent market earlier in the season. And the fact that no, neither one of those guys as run stuffers were there uh, helped you struggle against Jacksonville. And Travis Etienne had a field day. Doug Peterson drew up the misdirection that really challenged this Dallas defense. So I still think that the, the defense is where you're going to see the, the the ignition to, to making this thing go. The offense certainly has played better with Dak Prescott back in the fold. Of course, Philadelphia was the final game where Cooper Rush was the starting quarterback. 
since Dak took over, the, the numbers have been better. However, there's also been more opportunities for an opponent. I mean, the, the turnovers have been running rampant these last couple of weeks. Nine, or excuse me, 10 interceptions over the last uh, six games for Dak Prescott. No other quarterback in the NFL has more than five. So it's been a struggle for some reason over these last couple of weeks. There's been a ton of turnovers. And if you can limit that, it's going to give you some more success. But it really does start with the defense and what they do on that unit. Yeah, and, and you brought up, you know, that you guys didn't hold your end of the bargain. We kind of made it even less of a, of a matchup, obviously throwing <laughs> our back up in there. So it, we see we poo pooed this whole game. But but no, I, I mean, it's still it's still an important game, right? The Eagles yeah, are is. more than just Jalen Hurts, and that's not a knock to Jalen Hurts. Just like you guys were more than just your quarterback, you guys were winning some games. But, but yeah. the reason I bring that up is because the Eagles can go out there and they can end this season, right? This can be, well, end their season at least. You know, we can clinch the NFC, we can clinch the NFC. FC East. And on the other side, I think coming off of those two tough games, coming off kind of an up and down season and the lack of playoff success, like you said, do you look at this Eagles game and say, look, we can kind of right the ship against these guys. We can kind of indicate maybe uh, maybe this is a, a game that indicates maybe you can have some success in the play. Like how big of a game is this for Cowboys and Cowboys fans? I think it is big because even though you you have locked up a playoff spot, that confidence meter, like I said a moment ago, is lacking because of how you've played. You need three games, and it starts with Philadelphia, where you end the season strong and you build and and build and build going into the playoffs. Because if you don't, you're gonna you're gonna have to pick it up and flip a switch. And we saw last year this Cowboys team was not able to flip a switch. They they weren't able to beat good teams in in tight ball games late down the stretch last year. So guess what? They turned around and they fell to the 49ers in the in the wild card round. If you don't want to repeat of that, the 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 focus now is is a week by week. You've got a three game season on the way. Whether or not you win the NFC East, which doesn't look like it's going to happen, you need to play well over the, those final three games and at least build your momentum, build your confidence and and it, find some sort of rhythm heading into the playoffs. And I think that's on the forefront of the mind of this team and in this locker room is they want to finish strong. They don't want the the Texans and the Jaguars to become uh, a habit and games like that to, to become the norm. They want to get back to the, the dominance that they showed a couple weeks ago when they were tops in the NFL in terms of point differential and they were uh, leading the NFL in turnovers, which they are at the moment still leading the, 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 the league in sacks. They want to get back to that sort of game plan and, and that sort of success. It doesn't matter who's on the other side of the football. It just happens to matter this week that it is the Philadelphia Eagles. And like you said, with Jalen Hurts not in the fold and it's going to be Gardner Minshew, it, it changes things, but it doesn't at the same time. This is a team that has a chip on their shoulder, or at least they should, after the way they've played these last two weeks and trying to turn that around in week 16. Yeah, and I'm not going to, you know, harp on the last two weeks too, too much. But, I, you know, one more question to kind of tie it all up. We look at that the past two games, and it's kind of been like a tale of two halves. You, you know, you go out there, you're struggling. Even the three weeks, you can say Colts, three, three, you know, quarters, you're struggling, and then you just turn it on in the fourth quarter. Obviously, you know, kind of a tale of two halves with the Jaguars game. You were up big and then lose. But my question is, is who do you blame or i don't even want to say blame but who do you look mm -hmm. at and can fix that lack of consistency is this you know a player thing is this a coaching staff thing in your opinion who's kind of i mean you know for lack of better terms at fault yeah. right now man it's a it's a no perfect answer scenario you don't have really the one guy you could really point to but i think you at the same time you do i think mike mccarthy is the one that has to to make that decision and I mean, it's no surprise he hasn't been the number one motivator that you've ever seen in a in a coaching headset. I mean, it hasn't necessarily uh, had everybody wanting to run through a wall at different times throughout his coaching tenure, both in Green Bay and in Dallas. But if you're having problems, where does it start? It starts at the top. And that's where Mike McCarthy is as the head coach. Uh, but I also think it's on the players specifically. Uh, it's on Dak Prescott and some of these leaders that have been around for a while because there's a lot of youth on this Cowboys team. Talk about starters up front. Ty, uh, Tyler Smith at left tackle. Uh, Tyler Biotish is in his third year. Uh, defensively, there's multiple guys that are young guys that are making impact plays and taking impact minutes. Kelvin Joseph 
and Deron Bland, who have had to step in at cornerback uh, for the injured Jordan Lewis and Anthony Brown, have had to step in and, and play good football as first-year guys and second-year guys. So there's a lot of youth. So they look up to the guys who have been there before, at least to the playoffs, and have battled through a divisional fight. And that's Zach Martin, Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, Dalton Schultz, uh, Tyron Smith, now that he's back on defense, Demarcus Lawrence. They need some sort of veteran leadership to step up and be an extension of the coaching staff to try and turn around a stretch like this. Because like I said, you're not losing a ton of games. I mean, you're still 10 and four. It's not like this team is battling to, to win a poor division or they're just squeaking into the playoffs. They've clinched a playoff spot with nearly a month of football remaining. So they've been good but that's not the that's not the expectation this year. The expectation is to make a run in the playoffs, and if you're going to do so, you've got to build some rhythm here over these final three weeks. Yeah, I, I feel like any other year, uh, ten and four would be you know you'd be pounding your chest like, hey, NFC, yeah, it's great, right? Hey, this year it's like ten and four. That's it. Come on, get it together, guy. Well, uh, I mean, we look. It, at that's what it is. That's what it is with the Cowboys. I mean, think about it. Last year they were twelve and five. Yeah. Twelve and five, Joe. And they were talking about getting rid of their 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 coach and, and saying, nah, he didn't get the job done. He didn't win a playoff game. 12 and 5, we were healthy, and then they blew it. Whatever. That's just how it is. And I know Philadelphia fans are passionate like that too. You guys just uh parted ways with a Super Bowl winning head coach yeah. for a reason because there's an expectation. Once you get a taste of it, you don't want to give it up. And the Cowboys have lost that taste here over the last 27 years, and they're tired of of waiting on success. Philly at least got one in 2017. It probably feels like a decade by now that it's been <laughs> since you've listed, lifted the Lombardi Trophy, but a two and a half decades, more than two and a half decades, that's where it gets frustrating for Cowboys Nation. Yeah, my, my job is actually uh, flying me out to Arizona for the Super Bowl. I don't know if I'm going to wow, be in the Super congrats, Bowl. congrats, dude. I, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be there. Like, I don't know if I'm going to the game, but we have like a big Super Bowl party right before. So I, I'm pretty excited. I'm hey, pretty excited. That's I'm pretty cool. You'll get, to see, you'll get to see a ton of Cowboys and Bills fans out there, dude. Like, that's going to be <laughs> awesome. I can't wait for you to run into a ton of Cowboys fans. It's going to be a bunch of Eagles, guys. I already know. I, I can't sure? wait to see I my know, family. Man. I <laughs> it's, I can't wait to see my family. Yeah, it's funny. I live in Tampa, and my boss is obviously a Bucks fan. And uh, he, he, we were talking about it, and I was like, yeah, I can't wait to see. You know, in, in Arizona, I'm going to see all these Eagles mm -hmm. players. And he's like, you never know, Tampa might. And I was like, all right, never mind. I'm just going to leave right now. <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, let I'm you talk this out. <laughs> but um, hey, but no, it's, hey, it's going to be fun. Whenever my job flies me down there for the Super Bowl, I'll, I'll make sure and hit you up and let you know where, where we're at and where the parties are. So I'll let you. I'll, I'll give you the give you the quick invite. Good, good, yeah. Because uh, me and my, I'm tr I'm definitely gonna bring my girl out there and everything. So hey. we're gonna make it like a little nice little vacation. You know, I've never Very been to nice. Arizona. That's so awesome. It should be fun. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. So um, kind kind of coming back to this game a little bit. You've talked about it, and it's something that I've heard a lot of Cowboys, you know, fans and and reporters talking about. You guys have had some big injuries, and. It's going to affect the versatility of a one Micah Parsons. Micah Parsons loves to talk, so we love to talk about him. Uh, but what are you going to do with Micah? I, I, I hear, and you know, this is me talking from the outside and just kind of looking from what I hear. But people say that you know, there's a there's a discussion of whether he's going to be a linebacker or defensive end for us. Mm -hmm. Is that something we have to look at as the Eagles? Is there a possibility he might be uh, used a little bit differently than maybe during the season? Yeah, I think there's a chance that it switches up. It's kind of tough for us to say now because we haven't had a chance to see anybody at practice this week. It's been uh, like in the teens, cold, like the negative wind chill. And so media portions of practice have been closed. And even then, Michael Parsons hasn't participated yet. At least uh, he returned today to practice, but he's been dealing with a bit of an illness. I think you're, you're spot on, though, because it, it, it may not affect Micah in his specific play, but it does change the way that your personnel units are used. And without Leighton Vander Esch at linebacker, uh, without some guys on the, the edge rusher spots, I mean, Dorrance Armstrong's a little banged up at the moment. You may have to, to rotate him back and forth, where at, at this point in the season, he's mostly played as an edge rusher. He's been up on the line of scrimmage probably 75-80% of his snaps this season. He may see more of a 60-40 split or a 50-50 split. Uh, between edge rusher and linebacker playing at the second level. So it is interesting. Now, Dallas has a couple guys that they've liked rotating in. Anthony Barr, of course, the veteran that they signed out of Minnesota 
this offseason, and then a, a draft pick in Damone Clark, who have both filled in and done an okay job. They both struggled against Jacksonville, but with a week of practice uh, with the ones, I think they would definitely fare better than they did in week 15. So there's options there, but this is a defense that's that's really banged up. This isn't the same get after it, pin your ears back and, and find their way into the backfield sort of defense that the Cowboys had through the first 12, 13 weeks of the season. This is a team that is a, a little thin uh, up front. They're a little thin on the secondary level. I already mentioned Anthony Brown and Jordan Lewis and their absence at the moment playing a role. But I think Michael Parsons is kind of that domino that will be affected because he is so versatile and they just might need him as a body at a specific spot in the field. Yeah, I hate hearing you guys say such good things about Michael Parsons. Being, <laughs> being a Philly guy, I, I love Penn State. It just it, mm -hmm. it sucks. It's it's the same thing with Saquon. Every time I hear good things, it's yeah. like, yeah, I know, I know, they're great, they're great play. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that's awesome. And I want to switch a little bit to the offensive side because, like you said, you guys did add some guys, and now you did add a veteran to that side of the ball as well. Obviously, everybody was kind of hoping for OBJ, and who knows that you know? I guess that's never yeah. out of the window. But you got T. Y. Hilton. Uh, what you know what do you expect or what can we expect what do you think i guess is the best way of putting it uh how can he be utilized in this offense you do have some dogs he's obviously not the ty helton of, of five six years ago but he's still got some game in him how do you see the the cowboys uh deploying him and do you think that the eagles game will be a game that they try to utilize him yeah, I think he will be active. I, if I had to make a guess, I think he would be ready to go for the first time. I was a little surprised he wasn't active for the game in Jacksonville, but I get it. It was his first week in the organization, and he's still kind of learning and picking up things as he goes along. I think first and foremost, he brings a veteran presence to the wide receiver room. And I'm going to throw another name that you probably don't love hearing in a Cowboys uniform. But Jason Peters and his addition was great, not only because of what he could do by bringing some depth to the offensive line, but some of the the advice and, and some of the, the lessons that can be taught inside the locker room with a young offensive line. It's the same thing with the wide receiving core. T.Y. Hilton brings that sort of knowledge and mentality as someone who has been at the top of the league in the position. He's been to pro four Pro Bowls and, and done – uh, what it takes to be a, a feared wide receiver in the NFL. And he gives that to guys like CeeDee Lamb and James Washington, Kevante Turpin, Jalen Tolbert. He's like a he's a wide receiver coach that gets to go out and play because he can still run. I mean, we've gotten a chance to see it a couple times, um, and he can still get up and go. He's not necessarily the same burst of a T.Y. Hilton that you saw during his time in Indianapolis. He's not going to put up 170 yards receiving on – 11 catches and three touchdowns he's not that type of guy anymore but as a possession receiver and another target that can be reliable for Dak Prescott that's what he can bring to the table and I think it does I think it starts this week against Philadelphia yeah I think something that I've continuously heard about you know they, regarding Dak's you know and turnovers and, and I mean, they were, they, I wouldn't really say it's like struggles. I feel like he just turns the ball over too much. Like outside sure. of that, he's moving the ball down the field. So it's kind of mm -hmm. weird. Um, but I've heard a lot is that the wide receivers aren't getting separation one and two. Sure. He, it's hard for him to really trust these guys. You haven't had, you know, a gallop for half the season. You know, uh, Noah Brown was really your main guy for a long time. So it'll be interesting to see just having a veteran, like you said, out there that knows where he's supposed to be knows how to you know be quarterback friendly i think that will be a big help for uh dak prescott and that's not what we need we don't need anything helping him right now but <laughs> i i, I want to ask you this because i know you're a fan of the game i know it's not just you know a, a job yeah. for you so fan to fan right what are the eagles fans missing because realistically i, I you know look I'm very confident in my Eagles team. I know a lot mm -hmm. of Eagles fans are very confident this week, even with Gardner Minshew. How is it that the Cowboys can beat us? What are we, you know, missing as fans? I, I, we all have the bias glasses on, but in yeah. your opinion, what are we missing out about the Cowboys that we should maybe be a little bit worried about? Oh, man, that's tough because I, I think Philly and Dallas know plenty about each other. I mean, it's not like this is a known thing. This is like the what the fourth or fifth time I've been on your show, and I yeah. love coming on here because we, I, you know, just as much about Dallas as I do about Philly. And so, uh, I, I think both of these fan bases know the strengths and weaknesses of each of these ball clubs. Because honestly, if we're being honest, Joe, Philly was be, built to beat Dallas, 
and Dallas was built to beat Philly. That's what yeah. it is in this division. That's how the, the rosters are made. That's what the thought process is going into uh, the, the roster building all the way through. So it is, uh, it's, a, it's a process to, to get to this point. I think the, the thing that people are overlooking at the moment is, is just how good the running game has been uh, for Dallas. And a lot of times, Dallas won't put up crazy numbers. That's not by fault or, or lack of efficiency in terms of running the football. That's because of the offensive coordinator not doing a great job of sticking to it and not doing a great job of, of remaining vigilant in terms of running the football. Tony Pollard is 31 yards away from 1,000 yards. He was just named to the Pro Bowl roster, much like Miles Sanders. They'll be right next to each other on the Pro Bowl roster. Uh, and Tony Pollard is averaging five and a half yards per carry. There are only three others in Cowboys history that have done that. And over the course of an entire thousand yard season, over five yards per carry. Emmitt Smith in his MVP year in 1993. DeMarco Murray in 2013. Of course, he was one of the leading rushers in the NFL that year. And then Ezekiel Elliott in his rookie season in 2016 when he was, of course, a pro bowler. All three of those guys pro bowlers. Tony Pollard's now a pro bowler. And he hasn't even hit that mark yet. And he he averages more yards per carry in a thousand yard season than all three of those guys, more so even than MVP season for Emmett Smith. So the fact that Tony Pollard has been utilized the way that he has this year and the numbers that he's put up have been so fantastic. He's finally getting the league wide and the nationwide notification for it. But also, Ezekiel Elliott's been good, too. I mean, Zeke has been running the football efficiently. He's been that bludgeoning hammer in the middle of a defense. They're going to need both of those guys to step up on Saturday, or else it could be a long day for Dallas just because of how good that front seven is for Philly. I am exceptionally excited because they tried to do it uh, the other day, or not the other day, I mean, a couple weeks ago, 10 weeks ago to be exact. Uh, they tried to do it in week six where they ran the football, but there was no threat over the top. There was none. Cooper Rush couldn't stretch the field. Now Dak Prescott can stretch the field, and in the four games that he returned, Tony Pollard had over 100 yards from scrimmage in each of those four games. So that's what I think. The, it's not just Philadelphia fans that are missing that because I think Philly knows just how dangerous Tony Pollard can be. But I don't think the league understands the type of season he's been putting together and just how electrifying it has been to watch. Yeah, and, and you know, isn't he on his contract year? Maybe he'll be seeing Miles Sanders a little bit more next year. You know, hey, <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. You stop it, Joe. Don't you bring that on us. Don't you stop? Don't you start that right now? It it is fun to watch him play. You guys do have a very good running attack, and I. It's funny. I said that the other day. I was like, that's probably the one thing that kind of makes me nervous. But you said it perfectly. I think you guys stop it better than anybody else in the league. You you guys are, are the best. Your own best run defense. So it, it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> They take that. Um, I want to kind of piggyback off of that because you said earlier in this in the show that you know the, the expectation for Dallas fans is is very very high. Last year, like mm -hmm. you said, you guys were a first round exit, and people were calling for heads to roll. So I want to yeah. ask you. Maybe this is an unfair question. Maybe it's a little bit. You know, maybe it's something you don't want to think of. But mm -hmm. if that's to happen again, if the Cowboys are to go into this playoffs, they you know aren't able to get past the first round, second round, whatever it may be. What then? Because I, I know that Dak Prescott has, I think, one more year on his contract. You have big decisions with a guy like Tony Pollard. Zeke's making money. There's a lot of money around. What what happens next with the Dallas Cowboys? Do you think it could be as dramatic as starting over with a new coach and stuff like that? <sighs> There's a couple ways that that could go. Because I could see it getting to that point where it's... it's I, I don't think it will ever be blown up. It's not going to be a let's start over, let's let's fire sell and, and get rolling. I don't think it will get to that point. Um, but if let's say you lose two out of these last three, which makes it three out of the last four, you pitter-patter into the playoffs and you lose in the wild card. I could see changes being made on the coaching staff because you need what you would be what eleven and six overall. You would finish second in the division and a first round exit out of the playoffs. That I think there would be changes in the coaching staff and whether they they hire internally with one of these coordinators that they really like or if they go outside and hire somebody that's a big name on the open market. I don't know if that's necessarily even been in the thought process in the building at the moment, but they've got to finish the season strong. I, I think you got to win at least two of these last three 
uh, to, to make things interesting, end up either 11 and, or I, I, excuse me, 12 and five or 13 and four going into the playoffs on a high uh, as the two seed in the division and then win a, a playoff game or two, make it to a conference championship game for the first time since 1996. So there's there's ways that things could go south. No doubt, Joe. I really I, I believe that that it's not a foregone conclusion that Mike McCarthy's your head coach next year if they can't continue uh, to, to improve as the season goes along. You can't just limp to the finish line and expect to, to have all the confidence in the world heading into the offseason. Yeah, that's 100% true. I, and I appreciate you being honest because sometimes when I ask people that, they're like, Joe, get out of my face. I can't stand well, it. <laughs> you know? And that's the thing about it is is they allow us very much so. I mean, I know I work for the the star. I work for DallasCowboys.com, yeah. but they've been great about the, the, the way we can be truthful about our football team. And we can say things like that to where it's realistic. If, if you end up 11 and 6 and you don't get a playoff win i think there is a chance that they make changes and and the the front office isn't going anywhere the jones family is not going anywhere it would be the coaching staffs that would be changed and the personnel on the field as well because like you said there's a ton of decisions to be made in terms of the roster and the money allocated cd lamb is going to need a contract trayvon diggs is going to need a contract you've got a couple years left on dak tony pollard's going to need a contract soon I, there's all these different aspects. Think about the payday Michael Parsons is going to demand in a couple of years. So there's there's a ton of money storylines that are going to have to hit here over these next few years. So if you're not winning now, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. All right. So last question, and then I'll get you out of here, man. It really doesn't have anything to do with Saturday or anything like that. Okay. But um, a, a question I get asked a lot is, is this the best Eagles team that you've ever had? And it's hard to say no, but I mm. want to ask you collectively, you mm. see the Eagles, you know, obviously at the top of it, Cowboys right behind them, Jet Dallas, or excuse mm. me, Washington and Giants both can make the playoffs. Is this the best NFC East that you've ever seen? Do you think this is the most talented group of teams that we've had in our illustrious history? The NFC East is. We've been some yeah, dogs. You know, it's tough because they're, they're, at least recently, and all the recency bias is coming into my, my attention at the moment, but there hasn't been a dominance like this, at least record-wise, that the NFC has, has had in, in quite some time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm even trying to rack my brain over when you could have the, a team like this. Maybe, maybe 2007. I think that may be the only other year I would say the division was better because Dallas was 13 and three stacked. The Giants snuck their way into the playoffs at 10 and six, won the Super Bowl. Uh, Washington was nine and seven. They were in the playoffs as the sixth seed. So you had three of your four teams. Of course, it was impossible to get all four teams in at that point in time. But you had three of your four teams make the playoffs. And Philadelphia, even that year, was eight and eight. So I would say this season is the only one that's close to that season. But I, I think I would give the nod to 2007 because you ended up with a Super Bowl champion. You had the number one seed in the NFC, and that was the Cowboys at 13-3. and three. And then your final team in your division was still at 500 at, at the 8-8 eight and eight Eagles. So I, I would say 2007 at the moment, but this one's not too far off. And depending on playoff success, it may surpass what 2007 did. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle had to pick the one year that the Eagles don't make the play. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, the well, one. <laughs> I, was thinking, uh, I was thinking about your initial question on if this was the best Eagles team that you had, uh, that, that, that you had seen. I was thinking the Eagles in, in 20, or 2004, rather. I thought yeah. that team was unreal. The 03, 04 Eagles, that team was so fun to watch. But then you, you're even looking at A.J. Brown putting up Terrell Owens-type numbers this year in his first year with the program. And, and Jalen Hurts as a young quarterback kind of changing the game. It reminds me of what Donovan McNabb did. So it, it it's very similar. And, hey, History is going to repeat itself for those uh, who don't study it, right? I mean, so uh, I think it's very comparable to the seasons that we've seen in the past. 
Yeah, it's this is this is gonna be a fun game. I, I truly yeah. do believe that. I mean, we, we, Eagles and Cowboys fans are not gonna let this pass without an argument. You know, that's what I've learned. So I, I'm excited for this, man. And obviously, it's the holiday season. So Kyle, I appreciate your time as always yeah. so so much, man. Uh, if I don't see you, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. I hope you and your family have an amazing week, man. Um, and I'll see you in Arizona. But is there anything you want to yeah. say uh, before we get out of here, brother? Yeah, everybody have a safe and happy holiday season. Uh, so blessed to be doing what we do and, and be able to cover these two teams. It's so much fun. I love this rivalry. I always have. And uh, good luck, Joe. Have a uh, have a safe and happy holiday season. And of course, safe trips out to Glendale as well. Can't wait for you to see the Cowboys and Bills face each other <laughs> up in February. It's going to be great, dude. Oh, man, you just had to throw that in there. But no, Kyle, we will, we will definitely be talking probably around playoff time. Uh, but I am going to let you go. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate everybody tuned in. Be sure to hit that like, hit that subscribe, and go troll uh, my guy Kyle over there on DallasCowboys.com. He deserves it. Nah. Uh, but have a great one, guys. Peace. Type trash. I'm just here calling cool, cool, Philly Philly the podcast. And we can call him Hand Dog or watch my score off the hand off. Rest of the division, your man saw Jackson like a Sean, hunting like Randall. Season here, early time to do him in. Your boy Philly Fresco. Thanks for tuning in. Tune